Hey there, everybody, and welcome to tonight's episode of Day Tripper Photo Web Talk. Uh, once again, we've got our good friend Dr. Ross joining us. Um, we're going to be discussing HDR photography. So Ross has a really great uh, way of discussing 32-bit HDR. It's a special technique that I'm not even really familiar with. So thank you, Ross, for being on our show tonight. My pleasure. And, and uh, yeah, we're going to get to that in just a second. Uh, first, for those of you who don't know, my name is Brian Weiss. I own Day Tripper Photo, a service where we teach photography on day trips and on nature walks and really cool places uh, while actually doing it. So in like the cages and with the the wolves and lynx and things like that in the Muskoka Wildlife Center and in Algonquin Park and all kinds of great places. In fact, March 3rd, we've got a great portrait session that we have planned here in Newmarket. So for those of you who want to learn how to do constant light, one light, two light, basic photography gear to achieve professional images, you should go to www.daytripperphoto.com to register for that session right away. Um, so that's basically me in a nutshell. Um, Darren, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Had a good day. Got lots of paperwork done, getting ready to pay my income tax. Oh, yay, it is the season. Give all that money to the government, yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> I teach, uh, teach workshops for Henry's School of Imaging. If you're looking to learn how to use your camera, you can come into uh, Henry's location, and uh, I can teach you. Uh, any location, I'll go to Waterloo, go to Mississauga, go to Oshawa. They send me all over. You never know where I'm going to be. What about Winnipeg? Are you going to go out uh, and hang out with Ross in Winnipeg? I'm trying to get out to Winnipeg. I just love it so much there at the corner of Portage and Maine, sticking my you know tongue on the lamppost and that kind of stuff. Well, that was you. Watching the newspapers fly by. <laughs> you know, the ones that blow across from Edmonton over to Toronto. Yeah. I guess you'd have to live there to know what you're talking about. So. I, the, wind, the, the windy city, yes. Or just visit. <laughs> yeah, right. And I do I do private training, interior pictures of homes, virtual tours, all that kind of cool stuff. So if you're looking for something like that, you can give me a call. And I like to say hi to my friend Bob out in Barrie. He's watching us tonight. I'm sure he's going to have a few questions for for the panel. Fantastic. Is that Bob McWinney? It is. Oh, good, good. Well, good. I hope he, uh, he joins in the conversation. Great. Well, thank you for being on once again, sir. Thank you for having me. All right. And Ross, maybe you can tell us a brief a little bit about yourself. Well, hi everybody. I'm Ross Chevalier, the photo video guy, and uh, turning into a rather frequent annoying guest for these guys. How <laughs> we love it. <laughs> Can't imagine why they keep inviting me. <laughs> Greetings to everybody from Winter Bay, where it is cold and uh, cold, <laughs> and also windy. I provide private instruction. I teach people how to make photographs, how to do processing in the digital darkroom, and Oh, yeah, I also make photographs. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, and you are the co-founder of the New Market Camera Club. Oh, yeah, that's right. I that almost forgot. Fun club. <laughs> <laughs> food photography. Yes, food. <laughs> photos, food. Get your pictures in before Sunday night. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, thank you again for being on our show, and I know you're out in Winnipeg, and it's a, it's a bit of a chore for you to join us today, so we really, really do appreciate it. Oh, no, we're beating the hell out of Marriott's Wi-Fi tonight. Oh, and they deserve it. It's all they good. They do. <laughs> and uh, Gabriel, how are you doing tonight, buddy? Oh, not too bad. Thanks for having me on again. Absolutely. So Just... uh, maybe you can tell the whole world what you're all about. Uh, well, I specialize in uh, wedding photography and events, uh, birthday parties, bar mitzvahs, things like that. Um, I run um, Bousquet Photography with my beautiful wife, Trish. And um, yeah, besides that, um, a jewelry photographer part time during the week. And uh, like I always say, I'm just happy as long as I have a camera in my hand. So anything I can get my hands on. <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's funny that you say that, right, when Ross posted that little comment there. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, and for viewers who want to uh, join us and ask questions, thank you, Gabriel, first of all. Thank you very much for uh, being on once again. Um, for those of you who want to participate in our show, please go to the Day Tripper Photo community on Google+, or watch the show on YouTube and post your comments there. Or watch it on Facebook if you can find the link there and post your comments. Basically, we've got all these windows open looking for everybody to make comments for the show. And we do plan on answering them as they come in. So by all means, shoot your questions to us. If I don't see it, one of the other guys on the panel will see it and we'll answer your question as soon as possible. 
um, actually, when we announced our show, we had a whole bunch of people asking questions before the show even started. So hopefully, you folks are out there watching as well. Kelly and a few other people are watching tonight, and you'll get the answers to the questions that you posed us earlier. So, um, yes. Just one quick thing: if you go to YouTube and um, do a search for Day Tripper Photo. Um, I'm just doing it as, as I go just to make sure I have it step by step. So go to YouTube, do a search for Day Tripper Photo. Uh, all of our photos, all of our, our shows will come up and you'll see it'll say by Brian Weiss. Click on his name and then that will give you a link to the live, the live show going on right now and you can post any questions that you have there if you're not a member of Google+. Great. Thank you for pointing that out. And then fact, stop and go and join Google+. Yes. And if you're on <laughs> Facebook and you're loving Facebook, then stop and go join Google+. There you go. Okay. Okay. So that's pretty much uh, what we're all about. And today, as we said, we're going to be talking about HDR photography, and that's high dynamic range photography. So we're discussing how to capture images the way our eyes see it, rather than the way your camera sees it. We'll go into a little more detail about that in a few minutes. Um, but first, why don't we get into our creative corner, guys? Uh, the creative corner is our way of giving you guys a challenge, um, some kind of project that you can work on. And we talked about it at the beginning of the show right now because we want you to understand what we're talking about and keep it in the back of your mind that the challenge is this and I need to do this and this and this to make those kinds of photos. So the challenge of this show is make an HDR image. It's as simple as that. It could be anything. Um, there have been a lot of people who submit images to the New Market Camera Club and to a lot of the other things that we have going on. Uh, Ross and I had the TV show on Rogers and we had people submitting images to that and HDR can be very overdone and very underdone. There's all kinds of different levels that you're going to find people um, practice their HDR techniques. So try and make an image to simulate what your eye sees not those super surreal, um, over-the-top, blacked-out sky kind of HDR images that you might find if you search HDR on Google. Um, why don't I ask Ross what you think about something like that as far as, you know, when somebody submits an image for HDR, what would you suggest they do just off the top to, to keep it clean and to just kind of, you know, understand the basics and work with the basics of an HDR? Oh, well, sure, Brian. I mean, I think the idea with an HDR is your goal is to be able to capture all the exposure zones in the this, in this scene. And I know you're a student of Ansel Adams, and the other guys are as well, so you understand what I talk, mean when I talk about zones. Our cameras can handle five and a half, six exposure zones in a single capture. HDR allows us to get more exposure zones into a single image. Now, there's, as you say, there's lots of ways to do this. What I'd like to show folks a little later on in the show is how to do what's called a 32-bit HDR. You don't have all the mapping and tonal controls that you do in an 8-bit or a 16-bit HDR, but if you're looking for photorealistic HDR, this is a great way to do it. It's very easy to do in Photoshop, and I'll show people two ways to do it, one starting in Lightroom and one starting in Bridge. Great. I'm going to show quickly a couple of HDR images, or just one image before an HDR and what you can do with it as an HDR. So this is my interpretation of what HDR is all about. When you're trying to make a photo that is really, really bright, very, very overexposed, it's, it's tough to make a proper image from one shot. So for example, something like this. This is a shot where I was trying to see the texture and the detail in, the, in the, um, the boards and the dirt at the bottom of the shot, but by making my photo exposed for that, it blew out the window. You couldn't see anything in the window at all. So an HDR image like that, you'd be able to see everything at once. So this is the ability that you can see out the window, you can see the shadow detail, and you can see everything involved. So by doing this, this was actually a three-image HDR that I shot with my old Sony camera. And uh, when I did the merge, it just worked out that you can see it all. And that's, that's really what I was looking for. As I stood there looking at it, that's what I saw. So that's why I like to do HDR. It's a really good example that you've got there, Brian. You know, there's been a lot of 
folks who used to take multiple shots at different exposure levels and then use layers in Photoshop mm -hmm. and paint in particular sections to do exactly what you described. With HDR, you can get there a lot quicker, and a lot of the software cameras that we see today will even do in-camera HDR. Mm -hmm. You don't have a lot of control over it the way that you might in some of the images that we'll see from the group tonight, but yeah, it's, it's quicker. That's a really good point. In-camera HDR is being sold and touted as like the next thing right now in a lot of cameras, aside from maybe Wi-Fi. You take one picture, it takes two pictures and smashes them together, and you're able to see the highlights and the shadows and everything in one photo. The plus side is it's making it a little bit easier to get proper exposure on a point-and-shoot camera and a cell phone. There's HDR apps for your cell phone and so on. The downside is not doing it with the full dynamic range that you would get by shooting RAW. As we always talk about, especially Ross and myself on the TV show, RAW rules. It's a salmonism. Um, it was Rick Salmon that said that, wasn't it? It was. RAW rules. There you go. Um, when you shoot in a RAW format, you're dealing with a lot more dynamic range in a single image. It gives you all the, the information. Digital information is there. It's all there. Uh, if you take two JPEG images, you're taking a third of the quality for each of those images, where true RAWs usually are three to five images that you're actually merging with all of the dynamic range of, an, of a RAW file instead of a JPEG. So where those cameras do a good job, they're not doing a great job. You're not, you're not getting the same kind of information you'd get if you were to do this through an, uh, an SLR camera in RAW. Would you guys all agree with that? Do any cameras merge raw images, or do they have to be JPEGs? I know my D800 will only do the HDR and JPEG. As far as I know, they're all JPEG. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would concur with that, Darren. They are all JPEG combiners. So where raw, the fact of, of shooting, or shot, sorry, the, the fact of shooting in HDR can give you this great amount of detail and color, it also may end up looking a little bit muddy in some point-and-shoot cameras when you merge them. I don't think the D800 would be as bad as a point-and-shoot for doing it. Of course, you would hope not with a $3,000 camera, but um, it definitely isn't as good as merging them as some of the images you're going to see now. In fact, why don't I share one more image? And you know, I'll go so far as to say this is, I think, Ross's favorite image that I've shot in an HDR. Um, this is Absolutely. a photo that I shot of my cousin Steven, his car, um, we were just driving around. I, I went over to their place for Thanksgiving. He says, Brian, get in the car. We're going for a drive. I had my camera. We pulled over to the side of the road, and bada-bing. So this is actually shot with five images uh, from Mr. Snaps, of course, and uh, 1424 lens on there, so it looks really wide. And because I shot five photos in a row, and I was hand-holding this. This is not on a tripod. Um, from one photo to the next, it was a little bit of a delay. So one cloud layered on top of another cloud, on top of another cloud. So the clouds are much more spread out. They're much more obvious. And the detail of the car, I mean, if you look at this photo printed on an 8.5 by 11, it almost looks 3D the way the car pops out. Um, and this is a special technique, actually, I'll be giving as my tip of the week, uh, using the high-pass sharpening to sharpen a certain area of your photo which made that back of the car stand out separate from the rest of the image. So this is just, again, another example of where HDR can be really helpful when you're trying to make these bold colors, see the car underneath the car in the shadow by the tires, see all the dirt on the back of the tire and so on. It, uh, it's a really, really interesting technique for getting great color and great detail from a shot. Gabe, anything to add? Um, no, not really. I mean, you guys pretty much covered all. We're going to be going into HDR in a little bit more depth mm -hmm. um, later on, so I'll save all the juicy stuff for there. Cool. <laughs> Which now, is making you think that I have juicy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Stop bragging, okay? <laughs> Darren, you actually Yikes. do HDR for your real job. Um, now, maybe you can show an example of a very clean, natural-looking HDR. Uh, how do you mean clean and natural? Well, s some of the images that I've seen you post on Google Plus when we were talking about the HDR were a very normal-looking photo. Unless you told us it was HDR, you wouldn't really notice it. And this is that, that broad variance between the surreal and the photorealistic that people don't really seem to see the connection to. They think HDR is all bold, surreal, very phony-looking. And it, it almost gives HDR kind of a bad name with the way that people can process or over-process these photos. Yeah, so uh, 
I can put one up on here. This is a backyard photo shoot that I was doing. And, you know, you're trying to get in the, the pool, the sky, and in real estate photography, you don't get paid a lot of money to take a lot of time. So the faster that you can do it, the better. So I went in, I started, I was using my D800 camera for these, and I started just doing the in-camera HDR. And I just wasn't happy with it. I didn't want to take a chance anything bad would come out. So I did the, uh, switch it over to bracketing. And I'm just switching to some different renderings of this uh, particular photo that I did. I tried a couple of different methods of rendering it. Yeah. And each one, and in each one, you know, they're coming up on the screen here. They're probably coming up a little bit different. But I'm just trying to make it look as realistic as possible, being able to see the detail inside the cabana, being able to see the detail in the shade, but still have the shade look dark, have that contrast to give the, the picture some punch and to have the sky look normal. Trying to avoid any kind of halo effect around the edge of the tree or around the, uh, the edges of the building. Yeah, that's what you usually notice the most with HDR is that bold haloing you might, you're talking about. And black clouds. And, and black clouds. And black clouds. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Now, you and know what, there's a place for everything. You can't say it's right or wrong because everybody likes something different. It's just in, in what I'm trying to use HDR for, literally high dynamic range to simulate what the human eye sees. I don't want to see the black clouds. I don't see that with my eyes, so why would I want that in my photo? My, my personal opinion. What were you saying, Gabriel? Sorry. I was just gonna just gonna say that that brings up a good point at, at times that you would want to use HDR. Um, sometimes I've gone out like today. I went out today to take a couple sample images for the show. It was an overcast day. Everything's exactly the same tone, no matter where you look. Everything is pretty much within the same, you know, one or two stops of each other, and and, and it's hard to take an HDR image some days. Mm -hmm. um, so HDR, the, the picture that you showed was a perfect example. We were trying to take a picture of inside a, of a room and also get the detail of the window, uh, detail of whatever's outside the window. Or um, if you're trying to, uh, one of my favorite HDR pictures from uh, the master of HDR, Trey Ratcliffe, oh. is, <laughs> Sorry, had a moment. is um, one of his, his children sitting around the, the Christmas tree, looking up at the mm -hmm. Christmas tree. So you have a lot of detail in the tree, but then you just have a little bit of light lighting up the children. And so he did a quick HDR um, of that, and you, you just get all the detail in, in everything. Whereas mm -hmm. if you were to take that picture normally, you'd have a bright tree and maybe a little silhouette of, of the children. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's, that's basically what you're looking for. And with today's Creative Corner... Um, that's going to be one of the challenges is going out and finding an HDR, an area where uh, an HDR is going to make a lot of sense. You don't use an HDR when you're trying to take a picture of a polar bear in a snowstorm. Um, <laughs> you would <laughs> you know, try to, to use HDR in, in specific areas and, and um, you, you'll, you'll learn as you start looking for situations to use it in when it will be the most beneficial. Absolutely. And Ross, um, you're going to talk about 32-bit HDR. What's that all about? So basically, when we create images, if we're creating raw images, we get to choose how many bits are being recorded. The cameras that most of you guys are using are capable of doing a 14-bit capture. But when we process, we can choose to process an 8-bit, 16-bit, or 32-bit. More bits gives us more tonal range. It's pretty straightforward. So if you're in the scenario where you want to get, and I like Darren's example very much, you want to show all the information that exists in the photograph, but you don't want it to look over-processed or over-HDR'd or whatever, 32-bit is absolutely the way to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very elegant system. It's not screamingly fast, and as folks will know, when we actually do create one, um, you're going to need a reasonable amount of processing horsepower. Uh, otherwise, it's not quick. But when you do it well, uh, it's extraordinarily effective. So I'll give folks a little recipe that I find works well for me. Uh, for the most part, when I do HDRs, this is the way I do them, as opposed to the heavily mapped ones. Um, but, you know, scenarios like, and you've talked about this at the camera club, Brian, if you've got bright metallics, cars, that sort of thing, 
that can be a great place to do HDRs. Mm -hmm. But there's also a perspective that, well, you know what, can I do HDRs for things that aren't full of contrast? And that's where 32-bit HDR can really make a difference. For examples like what Darren is doing, for landscape photography. And well, that, that shot that you made, sorry to interrupt, that shot that you made of the, um, the, the Christmas scene with the, the uh, what do you call it? Ornaments in the Ornaments trees. Ornaments in the trees, yes, exactly. Have you got that handy by any chance? No, of course not. That's on a computer where I live, <laughs> not where I am. Fair enough. That, fair that would have been handy. It would have been. But, um, yeah, I, I'm sure you have one or two examples of a 32-bit, or are we just going to process it and see how it goes from there? Oh, I have examples, and, and we'll, I'll, we'll actually go through how to make them yourself. Now, I'm going to do that ex entirely in Photoshop. Okay. And that's what we're going to notice. There's going to be some Photoshop discussion. There's going to be some Lightroom discussion today. Uh, there's going to be some discussion on Photomatics, I believe. Darren, you're going to talk about Photomatics a little bit? Yeah, I can talk about Photomatics a little bit. Fantastic. The software I used to use. The HDR sausage machine. Yes. <laughs> it's great for creating those creative effects. Very difficult to try to get a natural look. Right it's on. true, and which is why I find it so interesting that that's the software of choice for Trey Ratcliffe. As as Darren was, or sorry, Gabriel mentioned, Trey Ratcliffe is like the guru for HDR photography. And if you don't know who Trey Ratcliffe is, check out StuckInCustoms.com. Uh, his stuff is fantastic, and uh, I think he started that because he's mostly blind in one eye. So he was really wanting more bold colors, and for me, I think it's partially because I am, you know, kind of colorblind. I'm red green deficient colorblind, and if I'm seeing a landscape, having that brown hue rather than the nice pop in reds and different colors that come out from an HDR, I really do appreciate that a little bit more. Um, so was the red, red green show just gray for you? Yeah, the red green show was a tough one, man. <laughs> Except for the duct tape, that was fun. <laughs> well, that's great. You could see that okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so why don't we get in? Sorry, anything else to add? You guys are terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. It's all for fun. Funny games. Okay, uh, why don't we get into our listener email. Uh, we actually had a great listener wow. email from Kelly, and Kelly has been following our conversation on Google Plus quite a bit, uh, and she's got a lot of great questions, but we're going to start off with this. Uh, Kelly says, this will be an interesting discussion, as it already has been. I have a few questions. A, is tone mapping the same as HDR, or only a step in the process? Can you apply HDR to black and white images, and can you still get that look? I've taken a picture and realized later that it would have been good in HDR. Can I create an HDR from a single image? Well, first of all, tone mapping is a part of the process. Um, tone mapping is usually done from a single image, but you can do it from your compiled HDR as well. Uh, basically, tone mapping is a technique used to map one set of colors to another, in order to approximate the appearance of the high dynamic range images. So it's an approximation. It's, it's basically using algorithms to bump up colors and, and details. And I'll quickly just show an image that I've tone mapped in the past. This is a shot that I was doing a presentation, um, a five-week class with some, some of my, my clients. And on one of the weeks, they asked, how do I make this photo look better? And I said, well, why don't you try tone mapping? So here is an image that I tone mapped from a single image. And ultimately what I ended up getting was a lot more of the detail of the mossy green on the left, on the right side, I guess that would be. Um, the colors in the trees, the blue in the background. Now I kind of pushed this one to really emphasize the point. So the blue water is like over blue and so on. But this was a single image that I just happened to use tone map on and it made a big difference in the end result. It looked more bold and more colorful. Now that's a photomatics single image tone map, right? That was actually done through um, CS5, I believe. Oh, okay. It looks yeah. like, because Photomatics does have that. For folks who want to create an HDR out of a single image, Photomatics one button tone map is actually quite effective. Yeah, and that's the software that Trey Radcliffe uses. So it's, yep. it's good stuff. And it's only, what, 100 bucks or so? And it's a plug in for Lightroom, it's a plug in yeah. for Photoshop. They're yeah, there is a plugin. You can take them both ways. You can also get a 32-bit image out of Photomatics. Hmm. And one of the things that Photomatics does offer is they offer the uh, the option. Whoops, this is not going right here. Okay, let me just do it this way. 
And is that working any better now? Okay. One of the options that they do offer is up here in the top, tone mapping or exposure fusion. So photomatics, the exposure fusion will give you a more natural or less options to try to blend in uh, the five images as there are in this case here. Or you can use the tone mapping option and that gives you many more options to map more tones. And again, you'd have to, um, depending on your image and what you want, what effect you're looking for, I always try to use photomatics with the goal in mind of getting a natural looking image. Some people will take this software, they look at it and they say, wow, I can make, I can make an even better looking image. I can make something you know, really pop out or really stand out. Mm -hmm. and there is no right answer, there is no wrong answer. Right? Each, each to their own and what they like to do, what image they like to create, mm -hmm. what look they want to have for themselves. And again, there really is no right and wrong. I mean, it depends on the effect you're trying to achieve. And the tool of HDR, the concept of high dynamic range photography, is such a broad ranging thing that you can do so many things with it that, you know, choose your own path. And that's what this challenge is hopefully going to let you do is, is have a little bit more experience with what these things can do for you and help you choose that path, which route you'd rather go. I know we have a lot of people at the camera club who submit HDRs and you know maybe they're watching the show and they might get a little bit more out of that too. Sorry Gabriel. No, I was just going to say um, HDR the way that you want HDR. There's a lot of photographers where it, the, just the, the word, the, the phrase HDR will inspire you know looks of, of disgust because the, the, the over HDRing of images has become you know, everybody has their their laws. You know, you can't you can't have any grain. You can't over HDR. You can't, um, you know, shoot. Everybody has their little things with photography that they think that's the proper way to shoot. And and you know, it, it's become cool to dislike over HDR images. But if those are the images that you like, then shoot the images that you like. If if you get that reaction from other photographers, just ignore it. It's just. Yeah, everybody's showing them your reactions. You're, it's all right. You're, you're the artist. Show those people, yeah. Yeah. You're the artist. Do what you like. Mm -hmm. Now, Kelly had, I think, Brian, you said Kelly had three questions in her single question. Yeah. Tone, tone mapping, which you explained. Um, the question about whether or not you can do HDR after the fact. You've only got one image. And then she also asked mm -hmm. if you can HDR black and white. Mm -hmm. And absolutely you can. The one trick with black and white is to experiment whether you do the black and white conversion before you make the HDR or you make the HDR and then do the black and white conversion. What uh, would you suggest? Based on my own experience, I prefer to do the conversion on the individual images and then do the HDR. Um, experience says that when you go the other way, uh, you can still get a very nice HDR look but you tend to pick up an awful lot more noise. Mm -hmm. uh, you get more exaggeration of grain. I mean, one of the things that happens when we do a black-white conversion is it looks like black and white. So you have the appearance of grain. Uh, when you start doing that after the fact, it gets pretty choppy. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that myself. And uh, most of the time when I'm making an HDR, I, I like to look at the effect and the texture. Uh, I find HDR really, really brings texture out of a photo a lot more. Um, an old, I, I love urban exploration. And uh, in urban exploration, you're going into old abandoned houses, and there's a lot of uh, sediment on the ground and you know, other things on the ground, <laughs> which you don't necessarily need to elaborate on. And uh, when you do an HDR, everything becomes so vivid and so clear. Uh, so I really feel that Urban exploration lends really well to both black and white and HDR. And it also lends to getting really sick from a lot of bat guano. <laughs> Leave it to you to bring it up. <laughs> Dude, I was sick for a week. Were you really? Yeah. Wow. 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 Yeah, well, you know, it does happen. You gotta wear ventilators sometimes, you gotta, you yeah. know. Make sure you scrape off the crap out of your shoes when you get back home. I remember that house we were in with Peter. We were in there for about half an hour, and you kind of looked at me like, how's your throat? <laughs> nope, time to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's the big problem, too, is there's a lot of fiberglass and a lot of other things in those Mold. houses. Mold, exactly. Yeah. 
um, asbestos. I mean, there's, there could be anything in these old houses, so you do yeah. have to be prepared. I usually keep a couple masks with me just in case. Yeah, you go, girl. You do that urban exploration with the asbestos <laughs> and the fiberglass fibers. Yeah. If it's not dangerous, it's not fun. What do you want? <laughs> Raccoon to turns on the stairs, actually. That was another oh, yeah, that uh, was another nice. real treat you guys found. We're going to do a whole show on the things left in old abandoned houses when we come back. <laughs> Scat. And to to address the other question, um, single image HDR, I'm going to be giving an example and a quick tutorial on how to do a single image HDR a little bit later on in the show. So stay tuned. Very good. Now, another thing that she asks is HDR and portraiture. Can it be done and still look nice? And why would you apply HDR to portraits other than for creative artistic expression? Now, Gabriel, you kind of mentioned uh, what Trey did. That's kind of uh, in line with the portraiture. Yeah. Um, yeah. True. Yeah. Actually, I never thought about that. When I, when I envision portraiture, I envision sort of, you know, chest, chest up, sort of close up kind of uh, traditional portraiture. Um, now, Ross can correct me if I'm wrong about this. I know his model, his model is of the female persuasion, but from the HDR portraiture that I've seen in the past, I would say never do it to a female. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's more for... Exaggerating wrinkles and... Yeah, like rough, rugged-looking men, like, like Darren. You know who who you really want to you know bring out the character in their face. Um, that's more the. <laughs> <laughs> God, that's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I may I may be wrong on this, but I haven't seen any successful. Uh, all, all the HDRs that I've seen of females are the ones where you go click. <laughs> well, actually, and this is one of the places, Gabe, where 32-bit HDR actually can help mm. you. I surely wouldn't do a 16 or an 8-bit HDR of a female person because of all the dying that will ensue. <laughs> when they see what you've done to them, they will kill you, and they will have just cause. Yeah, it, it goes along the lines of um, never take a, a clarity brush to a bride when when you're going plus clarity. Only take a clarity oh, yeah. brush and go minus clarity to a bride. So, HDR has a, has a, uh, the effect of bringing out all the wrinkles and the pores in the skin and the stuff. textures. Yeah, right, that's, that's like what that. we're saying. Is that yeah. texture really starts to come out? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I thought about as soon as Kelly asked this question was Joel Grimes. Uh, please look up Joel Grimes. We'll put a link on our show notes. Mm -hmm. We don't want to spend too too much time on what he does, but he, this is a guy that makes amazing portraiture of sports athletes um, and you know really really high end sports people. And what he does is he HDRs. He goes to the stadium and he does an HDR of the stadium, and then he'll go in the studio and do portraiture of the of the star in the studio. So he's basically compositing. Oh, Darren, thank you. Yeah, com he's compositing a portrait, studio lighting, and so on. And, of course, he's trying to mimic the lights coming from wherever the natural situation was with his lighting, and then layering that on top of a, a true HDR in the background. So Joel Grimes is actually one of my favorite photographers. The guy does some great work and uh, definitely worth looking into. Oh, that's great. I love that pool one. The way he uses his lines and his background is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for bringing that up, Darren. No problem. Um, what do you have there, Russ? Okay, so one of the things that we talk about is can we use HDR for portraiture, and we can. We can do that only, though, with, I think, the 32-bit HDRs to be effective. So what I've got here, um, if now's a good time, Brian. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, is how to do a 32-bit HDR, and I'll show folks how to get there from two places. As always, we thank our, our resident model, Sandra for uh, being completely still. And she's uh, quite patient with you, isn't she? She's extraordinarily patient. <laughs> she's just wonderful. Uh, and for folks who may, you know, we've t used the terminology HDR a lot, and I'm not sure that we were clear on what that means. High dynamic range, I think we've explained. But to do build an HDR, you're going to want multiple exposures of the same image. So what I've got here, and hopefully you can see my Lightroom screen, 
is I've got a series of images starting here to here of this mannequin model going from minus three and a third stops, minus you, one and two thirds. I'm sorry, Ross, to cut you off. Are you advancing yeah. anything right now? Because it's no. just okay, sure. Fair. Go ahead. The neutral where my mouse pointer is moving, I don't know if you can see that. Can't see your mouse. No. Okay. So if I Put your finger on. Yeah. Put yeah. your finger on. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> there, that'll work. So the one that's highlighted now is minus three and a third. Minus one and two thirds. Nothing's changing on my screen. Oh, okay. I can't tell you. Must I think be you're just sharing the wrong screen. Must be one a pig. Uh, it might be. Let's try, try um when Maybe. you go to the oh. share menu. There we go. Oh, that one. Okay. Now you go. Now okay, go. sorry. Apologies, guys. We're in bridge. No okay, worries. so so here's minus three and a third stops, mm -hmm. and we can see that actually in the detail um, here. And I'm using Adobe Bridge for this because it's one of the places we want to use to get to 32-bit HDR so we can see that we're underexposed. We're underexposed in this case, one and two-thirds. This is our neutral exposure, plus one and two-thirds, plus three and a third. Now, the first thing that we see when we look at this is, well, there's one that looks okay, and the others look like crap. But the idea here is to try to pick up all the dynamic range that's available to us in order to make a nice image. Now, if you're working and all you have is Photoshop, you can actually do this pretty simply. So you just open, select your photos in Bridge, and I hope you can... Can you see the selection, guys? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because I can't see what I'm showing. Come to the Tools menu, and here under Photoshop, you'll choose Merge to HDR Pro. And what that's going to do is it'll take you through the process and return a 32-bit HDR, and that is a 32-bit HDR. Now, nice. it's kind of hard to see, but if I zoom it up, what I'm going to find is I've got a lot more tonality in the hair and in the whites of the eyes than I would in the stock image. So there's the basic image. We're no, we're just, you now. just seeing yeah, you now. Sorry. Okay. So if I come up here. <clears throat> so that's the base image. Still see you. At zero. Okay, I can't help. Sorry, guys. I'm not doing this uh, Google Plus thing very well. It's Winnipeg. It's the internet out there. No, it's not. <laughs> it, it's, it's not. It's Ross. There we go. There you go. Okay, you're back. Okay, so there's the there's the default image, this the regular exposure, mm -hmm. and that's the 32 bit. So where we're going to see the difference is we're going to see the difference in the tonal detail in things like the hair, where you've got a lot of contrast that should be there, and you can see we pick up a lot of really nice highlight control from here, and we pick up a lot of the darkness from this image. We combine them together into something that works really well. Now the trick with shooting portraiture and doing uh, a 32-bit HDR is your model can't be moving. So there's actually a quick way to do this. You set yourself your bracket. Be, this happens to be a five-stop bracket, uh, but it could also be uh, a three-stop bracket if you like. A nice wide range of exposure so you have good tones to work with. Put your camera in high-speed burst mode, and what you'll find is that most cameras, when you set them into bracketing mode, if you just hold the button down, it will only shoot the number of shots in the bracket. So, for example, if I shot, set this for a five-shot bracket and I did hold the button down, it makes the five shots, and it does so very quickly, and so as a consequence to that, you may not have the challenge of you know, movement and having to do go ghost control. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to share. I'm going to cut away from your screen and share my screen for a sec. Um, yeah. On a Canon camera, this is how you would find the menu for turning on your bracketing. This is the AEB option, Auto Exposure Bracketing, and you can see that there is negative one, zero, and plus one that are chosen. So this is a three photo, one stop auto exposure bracket. With Nikon, a lot of Nikons, you actually have to um, do five images to get a, um, a five stop 
or sorry, a, a two stop with five images. So you go negative two, negative one, zero, plus one, and plus two. There's five images to capture negative two and plus two dynamic range. And then Nikon's a little different setup. And uh, Ken and I just figured I'd show you because Ken is the hard one to figure out. Nikon usually has the shortcut. You hold the button, turn a key, and it's perfect. So. And can most Canon users on the 60D, 70D, 5D Mark II series cameras, they get the exposure compensation and bracketing confused a lot when I'm teaching the workshops. Mm -hmm. that happens quite a lot. Yeah, exposure compensation is just making it brighter and darker, and bracketing is actually choosing to make three or five images. But it's in the same place on the newer cameras. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, so if you turn the top wheel, you turn the back wheel, one wheel you're changing your bracketing, the other you're changing your exposure compensation. Great. <laughs> now, Darren's right. It's not always intuitive. So, Brian, uh, can you guys see the Lightroom screen now? Yes, yeah. sir. Yep. Okay, so we'll do this real quick, guys. You can see that I've got five images selected in Lightroom, and all we're going to do is we're going to send these off to Photoshop and make a 32-bit HDR. So select the images, right-click, choose Edit In, and choose, sorry, Edit In, Merge to HDR Pro in Photoshop. Now this is going to head over to Photoshop. So Brian, I'm going to give you control back so I can change my screen share. Okie doke. So for the people watching the video, um, uh, Google Plus doesn't always capture all the menus that come up, so the, the menus when he was right-clicking were invisible to huh. the viewers, um, but uh, they were there, so just visualize them. <laughs> just pretend you saw them. Yeah. <laughs> all right, you're back up, Ross. Oh, I okay. guess we're waiting for it to open. Yeah, no, we've got a... So basically what's happening is you choose your images in Bridge, or you can do it in Lightroom. You choose your five images. You right-click, and you go Export to or Edit in Photoshop edit in, as an HDR. Edit in, Merge to Photoshop, HDR Pro. Perfect. And so can you see the Photoshop screen now? Yeah, mm -hmm. you can see it merging. It's uh, doing its thinking, and it's got the bright picture of her right now. Right. So here's what's happening, and this is why Photoshop is so useful when you're building HDRs. It's not quick. What we see is it reading the raw files, each individually, and then as it does so, it puts each file on its own layer. Now when it puts them all on its own layer, that allows Photoshop's HDR function to really start to build this stuff together. Once it finishes building the layers, and I am remote, and I'm using a, a relatively low-powered laptop, so you know your desktop computer would typically outperform this, it's going to build this sequence of layers. And then once it does that, Brian, what format do we say that we always work in? Raw rules. Raw rules. So it creates these layers. It aligns them. So it does auto-alignment of the layers, and then it's going to open the raw images in Adobe Camera Raw as a stack. Now what's really neat here is up until this point, we haven't decided whether we're doing an 8-bit, a 16-bit, or a 32-bit HDR. So one of the very, very nice things is you can go through the process and you'll get to the same place and then you get to make the decision. Now we can see it's doing the crop to correct for any misalignment that could have occurred while the photo was being made. Which is good if your hand holding it too. Sometimes and, your hand moves a little bit, well, it's a little line for that. And in this case... I don't know if you guys are hearing that. Nope. What are we hearing? We heard in this case and that was that. And he's frozen. So I've lost oh. uh, your audio, but I'm going to keep going. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know that everybody's there. You can see that we've selected 32-bit mode. We'll choose Remove Ghosts, and that's it. That's all you do. 
You see, if we were choosing 16-bit mode, we would have a lot more controls. The idea of a 32-bit HDR is you don't want to do any mapping. You're just going to accept what it gives you. Click OK. It creates the new file. I don't know, Ross. I don't know if we're seeing the 32-bit versus 16-bit on the screen you're showing. And it's going to take this file and throw it back into Photoshop. While it's doing its thing, Ross, I just got an email from Jen, and she says uh, she's lost. She came in a few minutes late. Is this HDR thing a program, or is it something in Photoshop? Is it layering different colors and pics? Can you give me a quick, easy explanation to get me up to speed? Yes. Basically, yes. HDR... The answer yes. is yes. It's all of those things. All of those things. It's a plugin you can install called Photomatics or Nick Software or a couple other ones. It's also built into Photoshop Creative Suite. Um, I personally prefer to use it in CS6 myself, and I also have the Nick plugin, which takes you to different levels, and it bumps it up a little differently, makes it look a little bit more funky. Um, essentially, HDR stands for high dynamic range, where you merge multiple images into one image to see all the highlights and all the shadows and all the textures. And what Ross is doing right now is the process of that merge. So taking your images, your five images, and he's doing it through Bridge, exporting that into Lightroom, where Lightroom merges the images into one shot, and then it uh, then you can tweak it from there. So that's pretty much where we're at. Now, you can always rewind the show when we're done, Jen, if you want to catch up on what we talked about to begin with and watch it from the beginning there. There you okay. go. Okay, so we're back in Lightroom, and this is one of the wonderful things about how this works. This is our single frame shot. One exposure. Looks nice. Yeah. Right? We zoom in, it's nice and sharp. It's, it's, a, it's a perfectly workable image. But let's take a look at what happened when we did our 32-bit HDR, the one that just came back to us from Photoshop. Now if I look at things like the hair, there's a lot more fine detail here that just isn't there in the single exposure because basically what this has done for us, remember we said earlier that our camera can handle five and a half to six stops of exposure range? Mm -hmm. Simply by using the 32-bit HDR function, you're getting over 10 stops, over 10 zones of exposure control. So you can absolutely use this. Now it is very, very photorealistic. Mm -hmm. Right? It doesn't necessarily look like an HDR. Yeah, there's nothing so, surreal going on. There's no glowing. There's no bold, bold colors. Now that is a 16-bit HDR returned exactly the same way. Huh. So you remember when I was in uh, Adobe Camera Raw and I was choosing either 32 or 16-bit? Mm -hmm. With no process changes at all, sorry, what comes back from 16-bit, you can see it doesn't have quite, it doesn't have the blacks, it doesn't have the whites, but if I look at my 32-bit version, I've got all the tonal range I could want. This is particularly valuable mm -hmm. because shadow creates, you know, the sense of dimension. Mm -hmm. And we don't want the shadows to block out, even in a portrait. We can use 32-bit HDR to really enhance it, and if you shoot your camera in burst mode, you're going to be able to freeze your subject, let Photoshop do the auto align, let it do the initial crop. The only thing I did before sending these photos off is I set the correct white balance for all of them and I used the camera, the lens profile settings that exist in Lightroom. You can also do this in Camera Raw. You don't need Lightroom if you don't already have it. Camera Raw allows you to set white balance across and synchronize it across a series of images and it also allows you to synchronize lens corrections. Now that the image is back, now I could pull it into the develop module. I could do any retouching that I needed to do, maybe fix a couple of stray hairs, warm up something, tune the eyes, do whatever. But now I've got a 10 stop range image that mm -hmm. I can work with. And that's it. It's that simple. 
Thanks, Brian, for affording me the time to talk about it. Absolutely. Thanks, Ross. That's great. So basically what you've been able to do is make an image with all the dynamic range. So you can see all the textures of the hair. You can see all the, the clarity without looking overdone and overblown. Um, you've, you've, compi you've combined five images into one so that you get all of the shadow def um, details and all the texture there. Um, but you didn't go to that next step where you're, I guess you can call it tone mapping or uh, bringing out those bold colors and, and giving this surreal look. You just kept it as natural as you could with the higher 32-bit, which is can great. I, can I just sort of keep on the same track while we're here? Go right ahead. And I don't know if everybody saw on Ross's screen the 32-bit uh, interface. Oh, good. Thank you. I, I know that I wasn't seeing that when I was looking at his screen, so I don't know if I missed it. Uh, I'm using it in the Windows version, so I don't know. Maybe there's a difference there. Uh, this is in CS6, and the five images down at the bottom would be similar to Ross's five images of Sandra. However, if you choose anything other than the 32-bit up in the top right-hand corner, as soon as you lower it down to 16-bit, it opens up these adjustments down here for the, I guess you could call it tone mapping. Is Would that be the right thing to call it, Ross? Uh, that probably would be. I don't think Ross is there right now, so... Okay, because that might explain why his 16-bit images are coming out so much brighter and so much more washed out. Because in 16-bit or in the 8-bit adaptations of these, uh, you've got options on the right-hand side of ways that you can process the 8-bit or the 16-bit files. In the 32-bit version of them, you don't have any options for processing it. The only slider you have is underneath the histogram which really only effectively changes what you're looking at on the screen. It doesn't actually change anything in the image file. So when you do use the 16-bit, you do have to do some processing uh, before you bring it in. That is one of the things that, uh, that I did notice. Mm -hmm. Well, good. I'm glad you brought that up. Also, another thing, if you are doing it, uh, and I've shot these. These images here are all shot uh, with JPEG. And I was still able to get a really fantastic image out of this just with the JPEG files. And you don't need to, or you can do the same kind of editing that you would do in Lightroom with the shadows and the highlights. I don't know if Ross mentioned that. You would save it as a, save it as your 32-bit file. And then did he show opening it up in the camera raw editor in Photoshop CS? No. Okay, so... You'd click on OK. So you leave it in the 32-bit mode, and you simply click on OK. You don't make any adjustments to it. It does its own little processing thing. And here it is. Then you would, I believe the trick is you have to save it. So do File. I'll do Save As. And it's in New Folder 3, so I'll just put it in the, so I can find it again here, yeah, new folder 3, and I'll give it the name of test, that's always easy to find, test TIFF, and it's asking me about the TIFF options to save, so you leave it as a 32-bit floating, no compression, okay. I would then close the file, not save any changes, file, and I believe open as, no, how do we bring that back in again? Ross, do you remember we want to open it up in Photoshop CS6 Camera Raw? Yeah, you just say open. Well, what you can Find do your is... image, test, and then choose formats Camera Raw. Right. Okay. This is how I usually do mine, so. And then choose Camera Raw as the option there. Okay. Bing and it opens up in the raw image converter. And then in the raw image converter, it gives you the same basic controls that you have in Lightroom for processing your 32-bit your image. Yep. Yeah, and that's a really important point. A lot of folks don't realize that the develop options in Camera Raw are identical to the develop options in Lightroom. Mm. Yep, they are literally identical. It's the same code base. Now, Darren, you mentioned something that's really, really important that I didn't talk about, and that's when you're building 32-bit HDRs, at least, 
you've got to configure the preferences to return TIFFs, not PSDs. So if you do, as I did in my example, where you're going to launch to Photoshop HDR Pro from Lightroom, in your Lightroom preferences, you have to specify that the file format you want Photoshop to return is TIFF. If you specify PSD, you're going to get an error. You're going to get a, a, a blank image that shows up in your library that says, yeah, I can't deal with this. Yeah. And, and, no, other, and no other useful information. Mm -hmm. And in Lightroom, under the external editing, if you do try to change it to the Photoshop PSD format, there is a warning screen that will come up and it lets you know that you might not get all the compatibility. So if you are going in and configuring things differently in your Lightroom preferences, you just want to be careful on that one. The, the, TIFF, the TIFF file is a recommended format, even though it's an Adobe product, which is, which is strange, but that's just the way it is. Guys, I got a question. Uh, Maureen asks us, what if you have one image copied it in different exposures into five saved images, could you then do that as an HDR? Yes. And I, have, I have a lot of people asking me about this, and yep. for me, yes, you can do it, but what about, like, say, for example, I make an image, and it's a normal exposure, and then I say, all right, well, I'm going to make this normal exposure, I'm going to take it into Photoshop, I'm going to brighten it up, and I'm going to save it as a brighter photo. Then I'm going to take that same photo and darken it down and save it as a darker photo. Well, mm -hmm. unless you're shooting in RAW, if you're shooting in JPEG, you're basically, when you brighten it up too much, you're going to see a lot of grain show through. When you darken it down too much, you're going to lose a lot of detail and texture. Unfortunately, when you do all these things, you're just not dealing with the same kind of information as you would with five separate RAW exposures. Would you agree with that, Darren? You're not going to get the same amount of punch out of it, but you will get what I've noticed to be a slightly better result processing the one image, process darker, medium, and lighter, or take it to five exposures, if you will, you will get a, uh, a better result out of that than you would out of just processing the one raw image in Lightroom or in the camera raw editor of uh, Photoshop. Yeah, Brian, if I might uh, add just a comment to what Darren said. When you do a shift after the fact on a raw image, how are you making sure that that data goes into the raw image before you import it again? The default is to create an XMP sidecar, right? So one of the things that you'll have to do is if you're going to do that, take an image, make a copy of it, change the exposure, make a copy, change the exposure, you're going to have to put that into a raw format that contains the instructions for the exposure shift in that single file. And that means you're also going to have to do a DNG conversion because if you use the native RAW formats that come out of your Nikons, the NEFs, if out of the Canon, the CR2s, or any other RAW format, if you want any of those corrections you've made, you've also got to include the sidecars. Mm -hmm. And that's not trivial. Couldn't you just export it as a TIFF file and still contain all of that? You could do it with a TIFF, but as you know, Darren, what, what that's going to do to the performance it's going to go in the toilet because this TIFF file is going to be six to seven times larger than a RAW file. And now you're dealing with five ridiculously big files that you're trying to merge. Well, yeah. I mean, let's use Darren's example. I mean, he's using a terrific camera in the D800. So, Darren, what's a RAW, what's a RAW file out of the D800? About 42 meg? About 40 megs, yeah. Yeah. So My, my, my 32-bit, five exposure 32-bit files. Now, these are taken from JPEG images, mind you are at uh, about 225 megs per right. Tesla. No, and, and, you're, and you're absolutely right. I mean, if these were uh, RAWs converted to TIFFs individually, that 42 meg file, uh, it's going to hit about 212 per. Yep. And so now you're talking about processing a gigabit. A, tw a quarter of a gig for one file. And you're going to do five of those. Before you merge them? Before you merge them, that's definitely a take a week vacation. 
<laughs> and it might be done when you get back. Oh, and so, by yeah. the way, come see me at Henry's because we're having a great sale on backup hard drives. Yeah, really? And uh, you're going to need a couple terabytes of that. <laughs> yeah, call Gabriel. He can build you a 20 gig array. There you go. You're going to need yeah, that before, for your first six photos. Before I got my, uh, my current computer that I have now, it was um, click the button, go have dinner, take a shower, tuck the sun in, come back, watch a movie, and then it'll be done. <laughs> yeah, so right. With my current setup now, it, it's done before I get out of the chair, so that's always nice. But yeah, that's the <laughs> setup you have. Um, okay, so we've talked about how to do the 32-bit, and, and that was great. We've talked about um, some basics of photomatics with the tone mapping. And tone mapping is, again, uh, it's more of an algorithm to bump up colors and do things like that. So it's part of the process of making an HDR. Um, we've answered Kelly's questions, I think, mostly. Uh, da -da 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 now, we wanted to get into a little bit more about the um, how you do it. So I'm going to go into quickly how to do a an HDR from five images, just quickly go through it. And, and actually, you know what, Ross pretty much did the whole thing, but you took it to a 32-bit. Well, I, I did a 32-bit. I didn't do the 16-bit. Okay. And that's where, that's where, like, you did those beautiful car images last year from the auto show. Mm -hmm. And you started doing them again, for, I think, from this week weekend's shoot. And I, I want to show some examples of that. That's the kind of thing where you really can make a difference by building an HDR. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you go around the auto show, you take pictures, uh, they're boring. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's funny, you know, because I did all these HDR images, and I'm going to share a couple photos with everybody. Um, one HDR and one single image just edited. Just edited through Lightroom. Or, sorry, through uh, Creative Suite. So let me open these up, and I'm going to do a quick share. The first image you're going to see is the HDR version. So this is a funky little car. This is the, um, uh, I guess you can say, uh, a concept car of the smart car or something. And this is the HDR shot. So this is five images shot in RAW, merged through Photoshop, and um, done the same way that Ross did it, but I didn't go to the 32-bit. This is the 16-bit HDR of this vehicle. And this is the single image. Now, it may be kind of difficult to see, but this is actually more like the car actually looked. Um, I actually prefer the look better. And there's no ghosting. One person that asked me, like, where did you get all the color from and all the yellows and the oranges and stuff coming out from there? Well, that's just the paint job. The HDR just shows all the subtleties and the, the way I did the post-production with the contrast adjustments and, you know, all the other things that I did. Actually, Ross gave me some great tips on how to do the hold the option button down and Darren talked about this on last week's show where you hold the option button down and do your exposure and all that and it gives you a really clear idea of what the picture will look like. Um, that's how I achieved this photo and I really do prefer the non-HDR to the HDR. And again, there's the HDR version coming through. It's darker, it's not quite as much detail and I spent equally as much time on both of these to make sure I did them as best as I could. So it wasn't that I chose to make the non-HDR look better. It, and again, that's my preference. Some people may like this better. But you'll notice none of them have the ghosting. None of them have that really overdone effect. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, so that's that. Um, so that was one thing. Now, I, I had an image that I shot that I just was not impressed with, and I'm going to see if I can find that. And well, Darren, sorry. Well, well, while you're doing that, I'd just like to let everybody know that maybe they don't have uh, a lot of money, they don't have Photoshop CS5 or CS6, maybe they, all they have is Photoshop Elements. In Photoshop Elements, I believe it came out in Elements version 9. So it's out in 9, it's out in 10, and it's out in Photoshop Elements 11. That They've got this cool thing, and I've got the five images up that I was working with uh, a few minutes ago. This is and Elements that you're working in here? This is Photoshop Elements, okay. and under the File New menu, is where they've got all these cool little features called Photo Merge, Photo Merge Group Shot, Faces, Scene Cleaner, Panorama, and Exposure. So all I did was I opened up the five images first, which in um, Elements you do. You open up the five images you want to work with. So I'll do that now. File, New, Photo Merge Exposure, and it will do the automatic aligning 
Uh, hopefully the camera hasn't shifted too much. It's not as sophisticated as it is in, uh, in CS. And it brings you up with this handy dandy little screen where you have highlight detail and shadow detail in the saturation slider. So if somebody's you know, feeling uncomfortable or they're nice. not too sure on what it is they'd like to do, they can get some really good results using just the basic you know, $89 Photoshop Element software. Mm. That's good to know because a lot of people do ask if Elements does HDR, and I wasn't really sure how it did it or how effective it is. So yeah. Elements is um, the everyman version of Photoshop. I mean, it, it's not expensive. What is it, about $100, $120? No, and it's less. It's less than a hundred dollars, and you can, you know, Henry's I think has it for a hundred dollars. Okay. And Costco or um, Best Buy or uh, Staples will have it on sale. I've seen it as low as forty-nine or fifty-nine dollars. Wow. Well, it's a good software. It's very, very capable for sure. I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to show you was this photo here. I'll make my screen larger for everybody. Now, can you see? I'm going to see if I can zoom in if this will help. Can you see all that? Yeah. This is the HDR version of this photo. Can you explain to me, Darren, what that's all about? That, I'm not too sure, but it sort of looks like you've hit the limitations of color bit depth in that the transition from the subtle shades of blue is being truncated or being cut off. This is another one of those images that I did a re-edit through a single image and it made a huge, huge, huge difference. Um, I'll close this one down and I'll show you the single image version. Uh, so you might have been trying to process colors and it was trying to make different shades of blue but there wasn't yeah. enough information from the single image mm. uh, to work with it. Like sometimes, sometimes, sorry, go ahead. No, sometimes it just comes down to the technique of knowing to know what sliders to use or which options to click to be able to get it to come out the way you want. Mm -hmm. And or sometimes it's just not the right software to do that with that image. Well, I found, like, I've been doing HDRs now for a while, and I found that uh, this was the first time I've tried to make some HDRs that I just I really didn't like. And I don't know if it's because of my techniques changing or because maybe I wasn't shooting correctly or something like that, but, man, the, uh, the shots of the, the same photo, and I'm going to bring it up here. I'm still trying to find it. Um, the same photo, non-HDR, made a huge difference. Okay, here we go. So here's that same image as a single image edit. And there's none of that glow. It's perfectly clean. You get all the detail. Well, there's a little bit of noise on there. So those other ones were from, or that other image was from five images? Yeah, that's right. That's just te technique. And maybe the 32-bit HDR method that Ross showed is the way you need to go for that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool, cool. Hey, Brian, did we not also get some questions from folks about other methodologies for HDR? We've talked about Photomatics and Photoshop. Mm -hmm. um, there are other tools, right? Yep. Gabriel, you were going to show us something, weren't you? Um, yeah, I, I have a method. I actually don't do a lot of HDR photography, but um, I'll, it, it, for some reason, like when I'm out somewhere, it's just not something that pops into my mind. It's not, you know, oh, I should try HDR here. I, I have done a few of them uh, from time to time, but a lot of times I'll just get the image that I've been working on um, back to my office and then I'll say, oh geez, I should have done that as an HDR. But luckily I use um, Lightroom and I shoot in RAW. And so just as a, a quick tutorial, this is something that you can do if you use Lightroom, Lightroom 4, and, and that's sort of the important part because the difference between Lightroom 3 and Lightroom 4 is is massive for, for the tools that I'm about to go into. So let me just do a quick screen share here. Well, the difference between three and four is one actually, but that's just you know, kind of technical. <laughs> the thing. difference in the capabilities of three and four are unbelievable. There's <laughs> more than one, more like 100 percent <laughs> so, improvement. This is an image that I took. I think it was an old pig barn or a chicken barn or something like that. So you can see this is this is the type of image that's. There's a decrepit barn. 
Yes. <laughs> so it's it's perfect for HDR photography. If I if I had had the the mindset at the time, I would have set up a tripod here. I would have done three my exposures. I shoot Canon, so I, I can do three exposures automatically, or I would have probably done six manually. And so you've got sort of the the detail and the in the wood out here, and you got a really dark area down here, and then a, a bright door on the end. So basically, you know, Gabe, when you get your 5D Mark III, you'll be mm. able to choose three, five, or seven bracketed shots. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't intent, know that. intent. Another oh. good reason to consider that upgrade. That makes me happy. And then when he upgrades to a Nikon, he'll be able to do three, <laughs> five, seven, or nine. <laughs> he said upgrade. That's so cute. He said upgrade to Nikon. <laughs> Humor the okay. boy. So if. I if I were to just grab this picture and drag up the exposure, uh, you can see that I'm getting more detail around here and more detail inside, but it's completely blowing out the, the, the door on the other side. So the basic two areas I'm going to work the most in is highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. <laughs> so this area here and tone curve. Mm -hmm. um, there may be a right way uh, of doing it like the, I may approach it the opposite way that you're technically supposed to but me with these usually I just grab the sliders and just start sort of throwing them around just to see what it looks like maxed out on one end and what it looks like maxed out on the other so you see Lightroom 4 um, does such a good job at isolating the different sections of the photo where I can drag the highlights up and down you can see the effect that it's having on the door on the other side so when I drag this up it's changing almost not completely it's changing a little bit around the edges but it's changing almost nothing but the highlights on the outside of that door so I just grab the sliders and I move them around a little bit just to see what they do now as I move up the whites you can see I'm getting more detail on the wood around here but I'm also losing my detail in the door so I can actually grab my highlight slider and drag it back down and boom I've got all that detail back in the door um, grab the black slider and move it up and now you can start you can really start to see the detail on the inside of the building starting to come out so effectively I'm going to go into the tone curve here and again just play around with this and bringing out the highlights I mean I'm getting because I shot raw and because I'm I'm doing it in in Lightroom 4 I'm getting many of the effects of of an HDR from a single raw image so now we've got some nice detail and color out here we've got detail on the floor down here and then we've still got all the detail change that a little bit all the detail from the scene on the other side of that door um, and then from there I can you know, play with my clarity slider a little bit or add some contrast to sort of punch it up a bit but uh, so this image here when I processed it this is my this is one I actually spent a little while on um, and so you can see detail on the floor detail inside the building whereas this is the original shot mm hmm so you see a huge difference with just a single image. I straightened it a little bit. Here's a couple of other images. So this is, um, you know, just in the car going on a trip somewhere. You see the, the, the amount of detail that you're able to bring out. That's the image I just showed. Here you go. So this was uh, driving down the road. There's not a huge amount of... of um, but it doesn't look like this would be an image that be, that would really be suitable for an HDR until you start realizing that there's a lot of detail up in the clouds up here that you can still pull out. So I single image HDR'd it, got a lot of detail out of the clouds, brought a lot of detail out of the out of the the um, the grass down here. So there's before and after, and then did a little bit more photoshopping to get the uh, telephone lines out. And then the last example, this was just this weekend, so. We were just at the Aurora Family Day Festival. Uh, they had an igloo. It's kind of neat to, you know, Jaden and, and one of his friends went in the igloo. And so you can just see really quick, I mean, this was maybe 30 seconds of adjusting sliders in Lightroom. You can see right inside the igloo now it does, you know, brighten up everything else, but I'm, I'm okay with that. So it's if you're in a pinch and you didn't get an HDR when you think that you should have, 
um, if you're shooting raw. And you're, I, I'm sure there's other programs that can do it, but I know Lightroom is incredibly effective. Um, you can still get that image that you wanted mm -hmm. for the most part if you didn't have, you know, if you didn't think at the time to shoot the HDR. Okay, right, and those aren't even tone mapped. Can I throw you a quick challenge, Gabriel? Sure. Take that first image that you were working on mm -hmm. and create five virtual copies. Okay. And on the first virtual copy, just move the exposure slider to minus two, exposure slider to minus one, mm -hmm. zero, plus one, and plus two. And then those five images, select them and then edit in Photoshop, merge to HDR Pro. Get that 32-bit image, click on OK, save it back in again, and then try your Lightroom adjustments on that 32-bit image and see if you have any more push-pull room than you had with the original single image. Okay, absolutely. I'll, um, if uh, the next person wants to take over, I'll do that in the background, and then we can come back to it. Well, that'll de um, you know that'll minutes. definitely work, Darren. That's a really good idea. And Darren, I know you're a Lightroom instructor. One of the other tools that would help Gabriel in that type of scenario, particularly the barn image, and that's the use of the adjustment brush. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he could make adjustments on the distant uh, scene through the window mm -hmm. on the interior area, and it's completely non-destructive. Mm -hmm. Brian, uh, could I have permission to quickly show um, another tool? I'm not going to take people through it. Just give them a screenshot of it. Absolutely. Okay. So. Guys, there's, a, a, as you're gathering, there are all kinds of tools available to us. Uh, Before you get too, too much into that, Ross, I do have a quick question uh, for Darren. Um, Stephanie asks, I found with uh, Photoshop Elements, I get a lot of haloing. How do you get rid of that? Is there a quick tip for that, or you just not, you don't push it so far? Uh, depends how many bracketed shots you have. You know, for the... $59 or $69 that you can get the software for, they're not putting the huge processing engine in there in the HDR conversion. Uh, so having maybe more bracketed shots and going less on the sliders for the exposure and the and the highlights. Great. Okay. Thank you. And Sorry, Ross, I guess if they're, if they're raw images, you'd have more luck than if they were JPEG images as well. That's a good point, and that's something that, Stephanie, you're going to want to make sure you start shooting raw if you haven't already. I think you do. I might be wrong. But uh, if you haven't started shooting raw, get to it. Sorry, Ross, go right ahead. No, no worries, Brian. So uh, I hope you can see the screen, Brian. Yeah? Yep, absolutely. So this is a very popular tool. And when I was doing uh, the more aggressive HDRs, uh, this is actually my, my tool of choice for that, uh, for that type of work. This is the Nix software. This is Nix software's HDR Effects Pro version 2. And the nice thing about it is when you're getting started with HDR, sometimes you don't necessarily know where to start. Mm. So here I've done a five, the same five-shot HDR merge and just let it come out whatever it was going to do. I haven't done any mapping or, or fixing or adjustment at all. And you can see it looks a lot like the 16-bit HDR that I got out of Photoshop. So it is a 16-bit process. But one of the nice things about this tool is you've got a much wider range of controls and you've got more starting spots. So, you know, as I just bounce around, I can, you know, I've got my default setting and they what they call balanced and they've got deep HDR and we really pick up a lot of tonality in the hair, although her eyes are starting to glow in a fairly creepy manner. You can also choose levels of detail. Someone was saying, well, what about black and white? Well, I sure wouldn't go with this, yeah, but see, it's this a is place to start. All these presets in, in Nick, there are some that are good to start, but then you got to tweak them and get them a little bit more subtle if you have to. Yeah. Uh, this is where you can really start getting a lot of glow coming through. Well, but, let's take a look at, there's a horrible glow. There you are. That's the glow we're talking about. Right? So they can be places to start. They have a number of different styles. And these are all starting points, too. You should, you should mention that this exactly. is where you begin, and then the sliders on the right side is when you start to tweak it. 
Exactly correct. And and one of the nice things about the NIC product is you've got a number of different predefined presets, places that you can start. Uh, that'll get you there. Now, Gabe was talking earlier about Trey Radcliffe. If you're a Lightroom user, you can actually go to stuckincustoms.com and you can buy Trey's presets for Lightroom. And so if you are a, you know, that Lightroom guy or Lightroom gal and you want the Trey look, it's pretty easy to get that using just presets. Those tomorrow. And, and the nice thing about those things is that when you click on any one of those little presets, uh, it's, it's the same idea as a preset in Lightroom uh, where you can see how all the sliders are set. So it's just really a, a way of setting all the sliders to certain positions. And uh, you know that's, that's a good way to learn how to start to see how they would do it, where, where they would put them to get that kind of effect, and they can give people the starting off point. And I believe they can also create their own customized preset, so if you find something that works, I believe you would have the option of saving that, would you not? Absolutely. It's very easy to create your own presets using others as a starting point. And that can save a lot of time. I know that I use presets uh, quite a lot when I'm using uh, Photomatics. I've got a whole bunch of them, and I just try one, two, three, or four, version one, two, three, or four, to get the effect that I want so that I don't have to spend time, you know, fiddling around with the sliders. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question uh, just came up from Maureen. She asked if there's a benefit to shooting RAW plus JPEG. I answered no, not really, not unless you're shooting professionally. I know uh, Brian Watts will shoot only JPEG because he's moving very quickly with his edits after the fact in between hockey periods. He's doing 300 images, pairing them down to 12 within a matter of 12 minutes. That's pretty important. Um, or another example is Joe McNally when he's shooting professional wedding or portraiture. He will shoot raw on one card, JPEG on another, hand over his card full of JPEGs to his producer uh, or editor where they will quickly be able to go through them and it's the raws that he actually uses for his photos. So. Unless you're shooting professionally and you have these requirements, I would say only shoot raw. Would you guys agree? Nope. Okay, Darren, go ahead. I shoot professionally, and I shoot JPEGs for my real estate work. So I you're not really professional then, right? What's that? So you're not really a professional. You're just faking it. Just joking, only joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? What <laughs> up? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, finish. Uh, the, the whole point of photography is to get an image. And it really doesn't matter how you get it. If you are doing HDRs, then you get a lot more wiggle room when you're doing your bracketed shots. You know, how much space, how much bulk do you want to have in your memory cards, how much processing do you want to do, versus what JPEG can do for me in the camera. What JPEG does for me in the camera is it sets my sharpening to a really great level. Uh, on my Nikon, it gets rid of chromatic aberration. It's got a lens correction distortion right in the, right in the camera body when I shoot in JPEG. You know, so all that work is already done on my files. Uh, and they're much smaller files, so when I am merging them together in the HDR software, I'm merging much smaller files. I don't have to wait as long. And when I have to get a lot of work done quickly, uh, there is no way that I'd make any money. I'd still be editing the photos from yesterday if I would have shot everything, you know, in raw on my D800 camera. Yeah. Yeah, and then again, like when I first started shooting in, uh, for, for HDR, I had my old Sony uh, a100 alpha and anything I tried to merge in HDR with the JPEGs it would basically stop halfway through uh, I shouldn't say halfway through 45 minutes through and say uh, sorry we can't process this there's not enough dynamic range so some JPEGs don't even allow you the enough dynamic range to merge them in a, in a program and then others I guess in Darren's case it works just fine yeah and, well, Darren, you, know, you know but in fairness Darren's a special case and he is getting old, so he needs that high-speed processing. <laughs> he just may not have that much time left. Oh, come on. At least I'm not Ken Rockwell telling everybody to shoot in small, basic JPEG. Well, uh, that's truth. You you certainly aren't. Thank you for that. You know what? It, to each their own. Uh, mm -hmm. I know most sports photographers shoot JPEG because basically on the breaks, they dump everything into photo mechanics so they can get it uploaded to the FTP servers. Right. So the photo editors have stuff that they can work with. I mean, Brian does that. Brian Watts, our, our buddy who shoots hockey. When Dave Black was shooting for Sports Illustrated, that's what he did all the time. Mm -hmm. But he was also capturing raw. 
for his higher quality edits. His portfolio work and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I and, mean, so, yeah. Stephanie, shoot what you like. I, I, shoot Ra- I shoot raw and JPEG even when I'm doing, you know, the high-end real estate stuff. If I'm not sure, I shoot it in raw and JPEG just in case. Yeah, I've actually Ra- was Maureen that did it, so. Raw is also good for learning. Um, I know when I was when I was first starting off, I always shot raw because if you go out when you take a picture and you look at the screen on the back of your camera until you learn how to read a histogram, it, it if it's a sunny day, things are going to look um, brighter than they are, and then you stop, you, you you change it so it looks darker, and then you get it back to your computer and you realize you shot too dark. So raw gives you a lot of freedom for screwing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember in the early, 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 early days, I broke one of the cardinal rules, which is never pick up a new toy on your way to a shoot. And uh, I was on my way to an engagement shoot, and I picked up my first off-camera flash. And uh, I'd never used one before. I'd never had one before. And, and I showed up, and I threw it on the camera. I started shooting, and I, everything looked good in the camera, and everything seemed fun. I got it back to the house and realized that every single image was like two stops overexposed. And it was just like, oh God, what have I done? But because I shoot in RAW and I used Lightroom at the time, you can just grab the slider, drag it down, do a batch edit, and it came out perfectly, and you would yeah. never know. So my opinion, if you, especially if you're shooting for HDR, shoot in RAW. It gives you much more dynamic range to work with. If you want to shoot in JPEG, if your requirements are such that JPEG is more uh, beneficial to you, go ahead. You're not breaking any rules. It's just you know opinions and what you need to do with your your images when you're done. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're not breaking any rules except for the part where we say that raw rules. Well, <laughs> it does. Look, look I, 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 I admit it. So you know, Darren, Darren has a has a use case that works for him. Uh, I don't know if that's the same use case that some of the viewers are going to have. My, general, my personal work, I shoot in raw. My yeah. real estate work, my I general shoot guideline there is: you unless you've got a compelling case not to do it, shoot in raw. And if you're really, really worried about using up storage on memory cards, you're in the wrong game, guys. Because if anyone told you photography is <laughs> inexpensive, <laughs> they freaking lie. Yeah. Oh, totally. Um, Jen asked me a question a little bit a little bit ago, and she was talking about having. Um, well, here, let me just read it. I heard someone say the subject has to be still. Am I right that you were talking about use at this time? Uh, is this why you need to take five of the same thing? Therefore, can you do HDR for a runner in motion? Well, in my experience, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll go uh, with no. <laughs> yeah, I'll go with no. I, uh, at the auto show, there's a lot of people all over the place, and I'm trying to make these HDR images. I'm bracketing. My camera shoots five frames per second. I'm sorry, Ross, not 12. Yeah, but at a time that you took Cheap five, his took 20. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that was really helpful when the Corvette with Stingray was spinning around and around and around. Ross is blasting off his five shots before I took two. So it makes a big, big difference when you have things like that. But... The point being made, I'm in a static situation. The car isn't moving, but people are walking in and out of the frame. Well, when you merge these images and you do the ghost removal and you do all the things you could possibly do, um, in fact, that problem I showed you with the front of that white Mercedes, that mess all there, that was actually because of the ghost removal. Flags. Yep. So basically, trees and branches. And it just... Well, yeah, flags, it works, trees and branches, that's where you do your ghost removal. And no, people... but they, they still create a problem because ghost removal is not a perfect process. Right. And that's where, that's where if you shoot in raw, then at least you can process the one raw image five different ways. That's right. You know, get something that's you know, going to be better than you know, trying to put together those five images. Now, remember, we're trying to give ideas to people to go out and try these things, right? We're not going to be giving away everything because oh. this, this is, uh, you know, this is this is what we it's do. An hour this and is how we show. Go. and it's only an hour and a half <laughs> show, which we're already running over a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, you've got to go out and make these images. So the challenge that we're giving the creative corner of the day, make an HDR image, just go out and make some stuff. We can elaborate as we review your images on the page. And remember, when you put your pay- your photos to the Day Tripper Photo community. Um, make sure you make a comment if you'd like us to review it or not. Gabriel made the point last week of saying that if you don't want us to review your photo, 
We won't. We're not out to just, you know, slam people's photos or, you know, talk negatively. We want to give you constructive criticism that will help you continue to make better photographs. So submit your photos to the Day Tripper Photo community and share what you've done and we will talk about it and we'll help you if you want us to. Um, I do want to share one image here. Actually, it's three images. These are some photos that I shot with, uh, I shot them all when we were out shooting Ross, um, Gabriel and I and Brian Smith, a couple other friends. Uh, we went to this old abandoned house and there were these great silos and you can see Gabriel walking in from the corner. Well, this is the photo that I edited in Creative Suite. As you can see, the tag up top, HDR Silo CS6. This image was done through Nick. Now, look at Gabriel. He's in a different place. This is the Nick software merging these images in a different pattern than what the CS6 um, program merged them in. So one minute, Gabriel's looking up. The next minute, he's looking forward. And this is something that I didn't have control over. I used five images, and the program just merged them by themselves and chose which blend of Gabriel we were going to see. So there is the Nick software. This is what I was able to get with Photomatix. Now, obviously, this is a trial. I know. That's why I've got the things. And it's a trial because I'm not going to spend the money on Photomatix. No offense, Darren. I know this is the program you use. I know this is what Trey uses. But I've never gotten photos I like from Photomatix. And maybe because I'm looking for a surreal effect without it looking surreal. Like, oh, come creators. on. That's like saying I used a Canon camera and I didn't have any luck with it. It just took boring pictures. No, so that's, that's why I got true. an icon. That's not true. Remember, Henry sells boring cameras, right? cameras that take boring photos. <laughs> no, it's absolutely true. Um, your software is what you make of it. The more you learn how to use it, the better your results are. Obviously, I'm more comfortable with Creative Suite than I am with Photomatix, so I'm getting better results that way. But you know what? I'm getting better results that way. So that's what I'll use. Why retrain myself absolutely. on something different? So what I do like about Photomatix and Nick, both of them, is they're not only plugins for other softwares, but they're freestanding standalone HDR tools for $100. So you can buy Photomatix and do all your HDRs through that. You can buy Nick and do all your HDRs through that. Mm -hmm. Or you can do what we all do and go with the Creative Suite or go with Lightroom and use these programs as plugins, uh, little tools that will enhance the photo you've already edited. So that's my take on that. Hey, Brian, just, just, what, just one thing there, Brian. Uh, with Nick HDR Effects Pro 2, because you put in, you made a very good example of which Gabriel did you want. Mm -hmm. With version 2 of the software, you can actually choose which one is your primary. That's right. You can highlight the primary and all the other ones work around it. Exactly, which is new. It's new in version 2 of the software. It's a big step that they've, uh, that they've done. You know, with Google acquiring Nick, we, a lot of us got really, really scared mm -hmm. about what was going to happen to this great software company, but the fact is they're doing work. <laughs> yeah, I'm just reading Maureen's comment uh, about, I guess she's talking about Ross still. Uh, da, 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 da. I was just thinking about taking up so much space on my laptop. Okay, I appreciate all the time you guys donate, helping us make better, become better photographers. Yo, you're welcome, Maureen. You're very welcome. We're happy to spend the time. Uh, it's what we love. It's what we do, so... We have no problem, you know, answering questions and going into all these things for everybody. And I appreciate that you appreciate it. So thank you. This um, is one thing. Um, yeah. Good one call, Gabe. Yeah. One terabyte external hard drive. It's like they're like ninety dollars now. It's USB three. One terabyte. You can drop this one. This is by Lacey, so it's not the one that I put anything really important on. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can drop it for like three answer. meters. <laughs> I have. Uh, <laughs> Hey, Gabriel, what happened with that shot you were working on? Did you get any better results? No, actually, I finished it. Just a sec. Sorry, this is a, a Toshiba one, one terabyte as well. I got this for $60. Oh, it's got USB better colors. 3. I like this set to work better. And funkier patterns. It's got to yeah. be better. That's got to be better. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me just really quickly to follow up on your question. Now, this is my first time doing an HDR that way, but this is my original image. And this is creating the, the five different versions of different exposures. And did and you go course, in and edit it afterwards? Yeah. Okay. And actually what I did is I, I um, ran, it through light, ran it through Photoshop, brought it back into Lightroom, 
and then applied the exact same settings on this image as I had on the on the 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 uh, original image that I did. Right. And there's actually you can see here. Um, now this is a uh, a picnic error problem in chair, not in computer, um, because <laughs> it's pretty much my first time running it through Photoshop, running HDR through Photoshop. But there's a lot more detail in the original image than the one that went through Photoshop. So obviously, uh, but out, out the door, the door in the back, I'm seeing more detail in that one. Let's see here. So you might have to boost your shadows uh, a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, you're right about that. There's a oh. little bit more detail there. Yeah, it's a good tip. Dara. Yeah, it, it really was. It worked nicely. That's a good experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's quickly um, go from the top here, guys. Let's talk about the who's, the why's, and the what's. So first of all, what is HDR? HDR is high dynamic range. It's when you take multiple images at different exposures and smash them into one shot so you can see everything in one photo. Very much like what our eye does. So we can see up to 22 stops from black to white, but a camera can only see six. So what we're trying to do is take six stops, six stops, and six stops, and merge all of those into one bold, vivid, dynamic range looking photo. That's what HDR technically is all about. Why would you use HDR? Well, let's run down the panel here. Darren, why would you use HDR? I would use HDR when I'm in a situation where there's dark shadows and very bright areas. I want to be able to see detail in all the areas, and I can't apply supplemental or auxiliary lighting to light everything up with, you know, 2,000 flashes around the outside of a house. So Perfect. Those high contrast situations are what do it for me. Excellent. Ross, why would you do HDR? Well, I'm going to use my auto show example, Brian, because without it, the photos are freaking boring. <laughs> <laughs> they do give a lot of pop, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, it just makes the makes a little more texture, a little more detail, it makes them look a little bit more interesting. And Gabriel, why would you use HDR? Yeah, Darren pretty much stole my answer. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I would use HDR when there's detail that I want to show. Like a lot of times, I'll be taking a picture. Say I'm taking a picture of a bride getting dressed and stuff. I don't want the detail in the window. I want to blow it out because mm. who cares what's outside the window? All I care about is the bride. Um, but then there's other times where I really want the information, the entire information in the whole in the whole area, um, and that's when I would use an HDR. Um, and just like that photographer that you're featuring, sometimes I would shoot. Uh, an HDR of the room first and then put her in it. Um, but yeah, when I want to get information that I know that the camera just isn't going to be able to capture, then that's when I'd use the HDR. Perfect. For me, it's about drama. It's about creating a mood, creating a, some texture, giving it a little bit more, as Ross says, you know, making it less boring. Uh, I love it for urban exploration, for shooting landscapes in Algonquin Park. Uh, on my day trips, then we go to Algonquin, you have the beautiful lake, and you have the tree line, and you have the sun in behind, and what you end up with is sun, water, shadow. So by making an HDR in that situation, you're able to actually bring the details out within that area. You can actually see the textures, uh, not just the shadow. So I prefer using HDRs for those kinds of things. Um, and just, to, you know, just get a little more pop out of the photos. Um, I love that. Now, one of those things that I find really lends well, and I talked about it briefly when I showed the photo of my cousin's Camaro, is the ability to add a little bit more sharpening than you would normally expect to have. So we're going to get into our tools, tips, and apps, I think. Uh, I think we've gone through all the other stuff. What do you guys think? I, I think, think we're ready for the one more question that you had. Was there? Do you remember what that was? Uh, where does HDR work best? Um, okay, well, again, my example of that was urban exploration, landscape, and Algonquin auto show, kind of things like that. Things um, that don't move. Things that don't move. And Darren says high contrast situations where the fill flash just doesn't quite ha happen. Um, Areas where you just want to be like Brian. <laughs> uh, that's when I shoot it. Yes, uh, what would Brian do? WWBD. <laughs> now we have another technique that came in from uh, our buddy Steve in Boston. Um, I'm not sure if this is the best way to do it, but he likes to shoot JPEG in the RAW. 
So <laughs> I guess that's sort of combining the both best of, best of both worlds. In, in fact, I think we should change our uh, our creative corner. Uh, shoot JPEG in the raw. In the show your photos with. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So does that answer all the questions so far, guys? What softwares are best to use? Nick, Photomatics, Creative oh, Suite, oh. Elements. Camera on a tripod is helpful. Some software may be able to align your images if things have moved around. But when you're turning on bracketing, what exposure mode should you be in? Oh, that's a good question. I prefer aperture priority myself. Yeah. Because I can lock in my depth of field, and then the shutter speed will just bounce around to adjust the light. And plus, there's so much vari- so much variance in shutter speed. I mean, most cameras go up to at least four thousandth of a second and down to thirty second exposures. So if you choose any aperture, there's a good chance that your shutter speed will be able to balance that light for you. So um, ap- aperture priority, turn on bracketing, use a cable release. You know, if you're really geeky, and you or don't self timer, or self timer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like he, the on. examples of uh, Sandra, the highest shutter speed was one five hundredth of a second. The slowest was one fifth. So if you don't use a tripod, there'd be nothing but blur. On well, it'd be blur, and, and if you use a, do HDR in shutter preferred mode, it's all going to look like turtle puke because there's no depth <laughs> consistent depth now, of field. What would we do to make an HDR for shooting in manual? You would adjust your settings manually, and you would adjust your shutter speed. Or I would adjust my yeah. shutter speed manually. Exactly. I would do what Darren did. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you're shooting in full manual mode, then you're not actually letting your camera bracket. You're physically choosing an exposure for each image. So, again, do it in, in shutter speed. Change your shutter speeds and let that do it. Unless, of course, you're an Icon user and you forgot and you left your auto ISO on and then it starts bracketing your uh, ISO. <laughs> I was doing that at the auto that. show, Darren, and I got uh, like five pictures in a row of the exact same exposure, just grainier and less grainy. <laughs> it was horrible. Yeah, turn off the auto ISO when you're shooting uh, HDR. Good, very good. Point. Icon, yes. Yeah. Well, even with Canon, Canons have it. Yeah, but it doesn't mess up on the manual exposure mode the way Nikon does. Ooh, Canon. Anyway, um, <laughs> okay, let's let's get into our t- tip, tools, and app because um, we're gonna have to. Yes. Brian, uh, I know you want to talk about high pass sharpening. I want to thank everybody uh, on behalf of me for listening in. I'm sorry, gang. I got an early day tomorrow. Absolutely. Uh, no problem. I need to bolt. So, thank you so much for contributing to the room. Thanks for uh, tuning all in. All the way from Winnipeg. Really, really appreciate you taking the time to be on our show today. Thank you all. Okay. Have, an Have amazing a good night. night. And hope the rest of your trip works well. We'll see you when you get home. Cheers. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. Okay, so uh, thank you to Ross uh, for being on the show. And I'm just going to go over a quick little tip, a high-pass sharpening tip. Um, I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to share my Photoshop. I just got to wait for it to open, of course. Um, What I want to do, what high-pass sharpening is, it's a way to sharpen your photo without adding a lot of contrast to the edges of your photo. So why don't I do this? I'm going to open up or do a screen, screen share Photoshop here, and you're going to watch everything I do through here, okay? So first thing I want to do is I want to go File, Automate, Merge to HDR Pro. You guys seeing all that okay? Okay, good talking to you. It's black. <laughs> I'm seeing a black. No, yeah, your menus aren't showing up. Oh, um, is that right? Share your desktop instead of just the Photoshop window. All right, that's what I want to know. I think desktop one. There we go. Oh, oh, the loop. The endless loop of death. Hey, that's cool. I like that. <laughs> How do you do that? Can Is I that better? That? Is it still doing it? No, um, that's better. Right click. Uh, right click. Oh, it's making funky sounds. Okay, I'm going to try desktop two. Yeah, this is great stuff. High quality. If you had a Windows computer, it'd be easy. Do you want Gabriel to show show it for you, or you want me to show it for you? <laughs> How's that working? Any better? I can see it. You can see it. Okay, good. It's so not I'm Photoshop. Gonna... We're seeing your browser or something. Is that what we're supposed to see? Um, no. Okay. Yeah, the, the selection window. Hmm. Yeah. No, we're seeing the window that has all yeah. your images with the show notes in the background. Yeah, it's not what I wanted. 
Oh, no, okay. I, didn't, I didn't think so. No. Uh, da, 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 da. Here we are, merged HDR Pro. Okay. You got that there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Great. So I'm going to choose my images. One, two, three. We're just four. seeing the menu saying source files, and your mouse is moving around. All right. Well, I've got four images up there. Okay, we can see that. And I'm hitting OK. So it's going to bring these images in. Back to you. And it's back to me because it canceled <laughs> doing that. All right. So here we are. It is doing its thing. I love you want to borrow my Blackberry? <laughs> <laughs> So this is the same thing that Ross was uh, was talking about before, right? How it's merging all the layers, mm -hmm. and you see how it's going, and then it opens up in Camera Raw, and of course we're not seeing that window because this is such great technology. So let me bring up. There we <laughs> go. Care. Next window. Okay, so you see the window with the car and the four images open. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Okay. You see where my mouse is moving? Yeah. Okay, so you see that remove ghosts up here. Yeah. If I click that, watch this fella in the background. Boom. See how he kind of comes into alignment? I'll turn it off again. Mm -hmm. And now he's got a bit of a blur to him, and there's another yeah. guy a little further behind here. Yeah. All right, so remove ghosts. And bada-bing. Okay, so I did that, and then I'm going to click open. I don't like doing anything else at this point. Does that mean he's a ghost? He is now officially a ghost, but I've, I've straightened him, so he's no longer a gay ghost. He is now a straight ghost. I don't know why oh, I'm going there. No. I'm going to have all kinds of people emailing me about that, including my mother. <laughs> all right. Hey, so email can be sent to Brian at... <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I've got a gay cousin down on the East Coast. That's her name. Her name is Gay. Gay. G-A-Y-E. Okay, so it's opening up these images. It's doing its merge thing, looking all cute and cuddly because that's a really fun car. Um, once we get all that merged, which I think can... Okay. So this is where we're going to show you how to do the high-pass sharpen. Can you guys see that okay? Mm-hmm. So I've got the car in front of me. The first thing I want to do is I want to copy my layer. So I'm going to hit Command-J. And did you see how I made a second layer there? I'm just mm -hmm. making sure things are showing up for you guys. Great. All right, so I've copied my layer. Now, the reason I want to do that is I'm going to blend these two layers together afterward. So I'm going to go Filter, Other, and High Pass. Now, when I do this, it's going to turn everything gray. You see that? Yep. Now, yep. if I adjust my radius, I can enlarge. We can't or... see your menu. We just see something change. Okay, well, that's fine. I'm, uh, the high pass comes up, and you have a radius tool. And right now it says 1.4 pixels. And as I go higher to 45 pixels, it looks really different, right? Mm -hmm. What I want to do is I want to just bring the edges out a little bit. So kind of like what you see right there. All right? So I'm going to click OK. And it's got two different layers. Can you see both layers? The gray layer is showing. And yep. if I close that off, there's the car again. And now the gray layer is back on top. So on the layer blending mode, and I can my mouse is kind of hovering over it here, I'm going to click, and I'm going to go to hard light. Now, all of a sudden, it's clear. And if I turn that off, you see the difference between off and on? Just a little bit more sharpness in the edges and all the detail. Is that making sense? Yeah. Great. Absolutely. You can definitely see in the grill and the, the areas on the bottom. Yeah, good. Now, what if I don't want this to apply to everything? I only want certain areas to be sharper. Well, this is where we're going to apply a layer mask. Now, what I do is I hold the Option button down, the Alt Option button down, and at the bottom, there's this little tab. Can you see my mouse hovering over it? I just want to make sure everybody can see clearly what I'm doing. It says Add Layer Mask. Um, I can see your mouse, but the menus aren't showing up. There's no menu yet. Yeah. I was, oh, okay. was going to do masks. You were going to do high pass. You weren't going to do masks. Well, this is all part of it. Okay. But I guess now I'm getting in Darren's bad books. Well, it's okay. You can, you, 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 you can be Darren. <laughs> okay. We're so, running late. We're running late, so... We're running late. We'll merge the two into one. How about that? So the high-pass sharpening just gives this whole effect of everything overall being sharper. But I don't want everything sharper. I just want, like, pieces of the front of the car to be sharper. And I'm pointing at the car like you can see me pointing. 
So, um, okay, so I've made my layer mask. Can you see how on that layer one there's a little black box next to the gray box? So I choose my brush tool, and I literally now just draw on the spots that I want to sharpen, like the headlights, like the grill at the bottom, all this grill under here. And wherever I draw, it's going to get just that little bit sharper. And I can be very specific with what I'm actually sharpening now. So I'm literally just making the front of the car a little bit sharper. And if I click off and on, you'll see there's it off again. And now it's back. So basically, that's how I do that. And then I just merge those layers. I flatten the layers. And I've got the final image, if that's the way I wanted it to be. And that's my quick how to do a high pass sharpen. Very quick. Anything to add there, Darren? Okay. No, it looked good. Awesome. Sorry, I'm just uh, a little distracted off to the side here. Uh, another listener just quickly pointed out that uh, we have some breaking news. I know we don't really do industry news anymore, but when a, a new camera gets launched while we're on our show... Yes, I heard well, about this one. We might as well announce that the Nikon D7100 was just unveiled moments ago. So now, saying, is that actually unveiled? Because I know that there was rumor of it yesterday. So apparently now today it's official. Uh, yes, yeah, up on CNET. Well, Blake um, says that it's got to be official. Well, doesn't Henry's already have a bunch of these in the warehouse? No, the 7100, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> so they're saying it's not an upgrade to the D7000. It's a standalone camera, um, 24 megapixel. It has a DX format, uh, and it apparently... The camera also comes with a 1.3 crop mode that increases, quote unquote, increases your lens focal length by 1.3, giving you more reach when shooting stills, albeit a lower resolution, 15.4 megapixel. So, in other words, it has an option to use less of the sensor, so it looks like things are closer. Yeah. And it also has a um, no low pass filter model, like the D800E. Oh, right. cool. So they, they can get rid of the anti aliasing uh, filter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For. Um, sharper images, supposedly sharper images. So that's um, that's gonna that uh, extra little crop crop section there. I think that's gonna confuse a lot of people. But um, yeah, wow. so you know we won't talk about it too much. But it did just break. So breaking news and more breaking news. Uh, Rex has just started following Day Tripper Photo on our page in our circle. So thank Yay. you, Rex, for following us, and hopefully you're watching the show as well and enjoying it as much as we're having fun doing it. Um, what else are we adding today? Is that pretty much our show, guys? I think that's a... Fixing a bad area. Just using go to our show notes, our 17 pages of show notes. I know. Well, there's so much topic to discuss for HDR, and we really are trying to condense the show and not go all over the place. HDR show one of three. <laughs> oh. Okay, so I'll, I'll just do my layer mask thing here quickly. Thank you. In and Photoshop Elements. Because this is actually, I think, what will help get rid of that problem that I was having. Yes. I, about the won't. glowing. Go ahead. So in, I used Elements to merge together these five photos. And what Elements will do is it will put layer one, which is your HDR image, on top of one of the darker images, or the darker image usually it picks for the background. So they did that, what I believe the reason they did that is so that you can create a layer mask and really all the, a layer mask will do is it either hides or unhides an area of whatever it's linked to. So I'm on layer one, I'm going to come down and click on that same little box icon that you clicked on Brian. Mm -hmm. That brings me up with a, a white mask, a little chain link symbol means it's linked to this guy here. When the mask is white, whatever we see here is there completely. If we paint black on this mask area, then it'll cut a hole in whatever it's linked to. So I'll go over and I'll choose my brush tool, and I'll use black as my color, and I will use a bigger brush size. Square bracket keys can make a bigger brush size. And I see something moving around on the screen. And if I paint out the pool area here, we can see that the pool's getting darker now. Mm -hmm. And in your case of your high-pass filter, those areas would be getting sharper. So the layer mask can be used on all kinds of things. It can be used to layer um, a high-pass sharpen. It can be used to layer a darker effect, a brighter effect. 
Uh, any effect that you ever want to adjust in Photoshop, mm -hmm. if you apply a layer mask, you can blend that in and out. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man how to fish, you feed, you feed him for life. There you go. So the layer mask is allowing you to hide or show whatever it's attached to. So you want to hide parts of this image or you want to show everything on this image, that's really what a layer mask will do non-destructively. If I switch around my colors, I can now draw and paint out that area that I painted in. So instead of erasing the layer, which we used to do in the old days before we had things like layer masks, which was destructive, now we can go back and forth. And one of the cool little things is, is if you're a black and white thinker, then you would never think, well, what would happen if I used gray instead of black or white? And with gray on a layer mask, it is, well, some of the area mm. instead of all of the area. Mm. So here's all of the area. Here's some of the area. And, of course, we could get to the default colors and have none of the area. Interesting. Awesome. So layer masks are just attached, whatever they're attached to. You can hide or show if it's an adjustment and hides or shows the adjustment or an area that the adjustment is affecting on the photo. In this case, it's allowing us to see the darker photo underneath. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So that's uh, another great way to use layer masks. Thank you. And, and masks are in Elements version 9, 10, and 11. So if you don't have version 9, if you have Elements version 8, a time to upgrade. And also in all Creative Suite versions as well. Yeah. And actually, I believe all Photoshop, even in Photoshop 7, I believe masks were there. Cool. Maybe not in 5, but I can't remember. Gabriel, you wanted to talk quickly about something else. Yeah, just um, for my uh, tip, tool, or app of the week, um, Snapseed. If you have an uh, iPhone or an Android phone and you take pictures with it, get Snapseed. That's I have a BlackBerry. <laughs> Can I use that to smell my BlackBerry? They don't make it for BlackBerry or flip oh. phones. Oh, um, and Darren, on the BlackBerry, um, I, I know, Gabriel, I want you to talk more about Snapseed, but uh, on the note of your BlackBerry, we had a gentleman actually forget one at our store the other day, and I'm so happy he came and picked it up because, man, are they feeling cheap. Oh, they're so yeah, lightweight the and new, thin. The, the, the new ones are You can hold it in the middle right. and squeeze, and it flexes. It's just yeah. a very weird, spongy kind of feeling phone. So anyway, stick to what you got, buddy. So go ahead. Sorry, Gabriel. Uh, no, I, that's that's it. If you take any pictures with your smartphone, um, Android or iPhone, get Snapseed. I'm not going to go through all the features. Just download it. It has a built-in tutorial. It's going to blow your mind. It's awesome. Is it like Flickr where your photos are stored there, or does it no. just process your photos? It's just it's just processing. So you take the image, you open it in Snapseed, um, you can do your editing, you can add effects to it, you can crop it. It's actually really, really powerful. You can use preset uh, edits, or you can make your own um, tilt, uh, tilt shift effects, um, um, blur. So it's, like, it's like Photoshop for your phone. It's like Photoshop for your phone, but it's, it's really actually easy better. to use. It's got a crazy easy to use interface. It's all just sliding your finger up and down and left and right, and the entire all the editing is done like that. It's really fun. I, I've created some incredible images just just from my phone. Um, I'm doing that, it's a lot of fun to use. Speaking of phone images, at the auto show, I was able to get this shot using my phone. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how good phones can be. Now, yeah. if I were to open this in Snapseed, I can draw to make the grill brighter. I can draw to make the background brighter. I exactly. can enhance. I can sharpen. I can crop. I can do all those great tools. From, Focal effects. Uh, yeah, lay, um, for depth of field, for the fisheye look, or not fisheye, um, tilt shift, sorry. Mm -hmm. It has all these great effects. Snapseed's a great app, absolutely. So what you're saying is I should sell my D800, get an Android, and Snapseed, and... That's all you need, man. Yeah. And they shoot JPEGs, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> ah, perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> and Android 4.2.2 has a uh, HDR mode built right into it, so, you know, you're, you're all set. You just go oh. like that, go down, and there's your HDR. Perfect. Yeah, you're actually making me feel kind of stabby. Um, one of my favorite photos that I shot on the day was, um, here we go, hang on one sec. 
<laughs> this is a photo of Dagny's new phone's display taken with my phone. Oh, that's a good I, picture. I have to have, thank you. I have to have Android, man. That's just because yeah. I want to take those pictures all the time. It was updating from, uh, from um, I think, uh, ice cream sandwich to jelly bean. And that's the little Andy the Android doing an upgrade. And uh, I just yeah. want Andy. Yeah. I want Andy's Andy. awesome. Oh, well, I'll get one soon. Okay, guys, um, that's pretty much our show for the day. Now, remember, ultimately, all we want you to do is make the best exposed images in camera you can make. But if you want to have a little more fun and, and you love editing, like we love editing, uh, try doing some HDR stuff. Using HDR techniques opens up a whole new avenue of exposure. Uh, it gives you the photography tools that you need to make great artistic looking images. Uh, have some fun and try and create something that you might not have done before. So get out there, make some photos, submit them to the Day Tripper Photo community, mm -hmm. and uh, you know share them with us and let us know what you think about the whole technology of HDR. And if you have any questions on how to do it, let us know. We will happily spend some time with you. Please come in and see me at Henry's in Newmarket. If you have any questions, I can help you there. Um, as far as software, Lightroom, Photoshop, you name it, we can help you. Uh, so come on in, guys. Let us know. And obviously, you can go to www.daytripperphoto.com that you see right about right there. I'm getting this all backwards. And um, yeah, so you know, partake. Enjoy photography. Let us help you get to where you want to be. Sign up for March 3rd Portrait Session. Get up there and make it happen. Anyway, <laughs> um, I've got a couple quotes for you today. Um, we usually end the show with a quote. And the first quote I want to give you is from Trey Radcliffe, but it has nothing to do with really HDR, so I don't know why it's a quote. But anyway, to me, it's better to guess at how something works, experiment, fail, guess again, fail, and keep repeating that process over and over again until you either figure it out or you discover a multiplicity of other cool tricks along the way. I think that's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And a little quote from my good friend Ansel Adams, who was around before HDR, says, an electronic and optical miracle creates nothing on its own. Whether beauty and, oh, sorry, whatever beauty and excitement it can represent exist in your mind and spirit to begin with. In other words, you have it all in you already. So go out there and make some amazing looking photographs. So thank you very much for watching today's episode of Day Tripper Photo Web Talk. Thank you, Darren, so much for being on the show and always lending us your amazing expertise. And Gabriel as well for being here and looking so awesome. I have to say that because we were talking about that before. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much as always for helping out and for being such a huge part of the show. And from myself, Pleasure. Brian Weiss, I'd love to all bid you adieu and say see you next week. And please feel free to let us know whenever you have any questions. Take care, everybody. Have a great night. Bye.